Hey, stop nitpicking in code reviews. You know how many times I would receive these nitpicks that I absolutely hated? My worst nitpick that I hated the most, the absolute most, was that we had a convention, or at least someone had a convention, and I did not agree with the convention. I refused to do stupid conventions. And one of them was to underscore your variables that are private in TypeScript. And I said, yo, dog, it's a TypeScript library, and TypeScript disallows you to access private variables. And their response was, well, actually, you can by doing at, at, you know, at tsignore. And I said, yeah, but if you're doing tsignore, you're fundamentally doing something wrong. Stop underscoring something that doesn't exist anymore. That notion, that idea comes from a time when we just had JavaScript. Now that we have private and public modifiers, you don't need it anymore. It's stupid to do that. Don't do it, okay? If somebody goes off the rails and accesses something that's been marked as private and ignores the, your linter TypeScript, guess what? That's them being stupid. It's not on you, okay? You can give somebody a gun and they can shoot themselves in the foot. That's their problem. That's a their problem, okay? It's a their problem. They pointed it at their foot and then pulled the trigger. Don't do that. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. And so those kind of nitpicks drive me up a tree, right? It's like, no, F your conventions. F that because it makes no sense. We're naming the variable without that, okay? One of the best changes I've made at work recently is to stop nitpicking uh, in code reviews. I, Dan Liu, I love you. I love you, Dan. Dan Liu, I love you. Uh, nitpicking isn't about code that is wrong, but suboptimal. It's pointing out a variable name that could be used more appropriate, like a more appropriate word, a condition that could be formatted more cleanly, or some minor simplifying of logic. Nits don't result in significantly better code, nor do they educate the developer. They're just changes that are technically improvements, if not highly meaning, uh, if not highly meaningful ones. Uh, I'm not really sure about that last one. Um, I would say that, see, that's the problem. It's like even, okay, get this. Uh, he, here's a good example. Uh, we're in some JavaScript and someone does new promise, uh, res, reject, blah, 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 blah. I've been nitpicked on this. It's just like, yo, dog. Yo, dog. How about you don't? How about you don't? Okay, in the context where they're at, it doesn't matter. Or if somebody goes like this, right? You have an array of numbers, right? And you do a reduce and you do an ack, x. Uh, ack plus x zero, right? If someone's like, yo, you should rename x because we don't use single n variable names, you're just like, stop. Stop, yo, stop. Okay? Ain't nobody caring about that. Stop. You know what I mean? It's just like that kind of stuff is just so effing annoying. Now, if your variable name is loads from data source and it actually goes and reads out div elements data, deserves a rename. Deserves a rename because it's fundamentally wrong. Totally agreed. But if you believe there is a better variable name than the one that's chosen, it's likely because for your brain, you understand it better. Now, some people won't understand it better. That's the thing is like people totally forget the fact that perspective comes into every variable name. And when somebody does like, you know, does it one way and somebody else does it another way, like a really good example is, is in, uh, you see this more and more, is like if somebody has some sort of class with something in it, right? <clears throat> And you do something like uh, time, and it returns, you know, uh, this dot current time. I don't know. Look at that nice underscore. I did that just to piss somebody off. Versus get time, right? These are two. These are the same thing, and people argue over this now because some people like the former approach better, where some people like the latter approach better. And this is like totally uh, your experience gets you into this place. You know what I mean? Your experience gets you into this place, and if you are super used to something, then you're going to want a time versus a get time, and that's just that. And for me, I prefer time. I don't see why I like get time. Some people prefer get time with a capital G because they're C-sharp losers, okay? I want a code base to be perfect, and in my mind, these nits were an important part of ensuring that happened. I used to conduct extremely thorough code reviews, filled the comments about architecture and bugs, but also so, so many nits. The nits often overwhelmed the other comments. For every major concern I'd raise, there could be a dozen nits. This is another great point. Great, great, great point right there. This is such a good point. When you overwhelm people with a bunch of nits, how hard is it to make the proper things fixed? You know what I mean? If you see something that's fundamentally wrong, address it, right? That is way, way better than being like, you know what? Your underscore in that private, you're missing underscore in that private variable. You're like, you just missed the whole thing. You know what I mean? This is practice of mine uh, did not make me the most popular coworker. Far from it. I didn't realize it at the time, but my perfectionism was toxic. At best, it annoyed people. At worst, it upset them, and those feelings lasted far past the code review itself. Exactly. There's people at Netflix I don't want to work with because they're like this. 
right? Like I'll avoid working with them, which is bad, bad on my behalf, but there's nothing you can do to get away from it. And now this is what they're known for is being ultra nitpicky. It's just like, ew, gross. I don't want to work with you because here's the deal. Anytime I go into code, I think it looks like shit. No matter who wrote it, when they wrote it, including if that person was me, if it is more than a week old, it is pure ass code every single time, every single time, every time. A couple years ago, a coworker proposed that we uh, see what happens if we stop nitpicking altogether. Initially, I pushed back. I knitted the proposal. <laughs> Why would I want to allow bad code to get into code bases? But in the end, we agreed to, uh, to a one-month experiment. What a great thing right here. I love this. Also, another great sign of a healthy team are people who are willing to go against what they think and just try something out. This is awesome. To my, to my surprise, at the end of the month, things were cleaner. Uh, better than before. We're clearly better than before. So much so that we barely even discussed whether to continue the policy. It was just sort of became a permanent because it was obviously an improvement. Uh, there were two big benefits uh, we experienced. This is such a well done article right now. Dan Liu, you did incredible. This is incredible. This is this is awesome. First, we saw a vast improved signal to noise ratio. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's just like if you have a CI that's kind of flaky. You know a, a flaky CI and you have that one test that fails kind of regularly? Who here's merged on a broken test because of that one flaky test that's kind of flaky? Who here's done it? Who here's done it? This guy's done it. Right here. This guy. And guess what? One of those times it wasn't flaky. It was broken. You know what I mean? But that's the problem about signal to noise. If you have something that's noisy, people will overlook things. You know what I mean? Imagine a code review that gets res uh, results in five nits and one critical issue to address. In the hu uh, hullabaloo of fixing those nits, <coughs> the critical comma can seem less important or even get overlooked. Not only that, but if they ask you to refactor a couple things, pull this out as a function, or go do that, the critical bug sometimes disappears from the code review and will be missed because now you have a restructured version that you can't quite see. What is Beast Co. doing? One, 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 one. Yeah, me and Beast Co. were a lot alike. Not a hobble, a hullabaloo. Yeah, a hullabaloo. Uh, without nits. Okay, what is going on with my voice? I can feel something in there. Sometimes the critical bug is uh, also fixed by refactoring. Absolutely. And sometimes you introduce a new critical bug by refactoring. We call that refactoring. Um, without nits, that one critical comment is the only issue that gets brought up. All the attention is paid to it, and right, uh, rightfully so. What is important gets a signal boost. What's important, what's unimportant gets ignored. Yes. Second, it improved everyone's relationship with code reviews and those who conducted them. I've seen plenty of people talk online about how you shouldn't take code reviews personally. That's, uh, that it's the code being critiqued, not the person, blah, 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 blah. It's a bunch of bullshit. I've been going through code reviews for a decade, and it still stings when someone points out my mistakes or pushes back on my code designs. Imagine, you, I, I actually don't really feel this too much. I just don't care. Like, that to provide a good reason. For the most part, I think that most people, when they push back, it's just a bunch of nits, and then I don't care. Uh, imagine you start a pull request, and the first reviewer points out a dozen nits. Your natural response will be uh, will not be zen-like acceptance. It will be to get upset. Uh, all you want to do is merge this code, but some jerk is making you jump through a bunch of dumb hoops to do so first. Now, or suppose now that you fix a nitpicks and send it back to be reviewed only to get blocked again because the reviewer noticed some more nitpicks. Yep. Yep. Developers like to imagine they are comp uh, are composed of nothing but cold, hard logic. But actually, we are humans with unavoidable feelings and emotions. Uh, what I, what was What was I really doing then or when I was thoroughly nitpicking code? The main effect wasn't improving the code base. It was making people upset with their uh, code and angry with me. I'm so motivated by this. Uh... I think, uh, oh my goodness, I have a tweet coming. I have a tweet coming. I can't do it yet. It's not there yet. It's not, I got to get sufficiently more upset. Hold on. I got to get sufficiently more upset at what I'm about to say, and then we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. I can feel it coming, though. Something's going to come out of me. I can feel it. Um, uh, they were less receptive to my feedback as a result, and it soured my relationship with my code workers. A couple years after stopping nits, people are far more receptive to feedback and code reviews, and I think much less of it. And and think I'm much less of a jerk. It's a night and day difference from before. Ultimately, our code base has not suffered due to lack of nitpicking. If anything, it is better than before because we, as a team, work together better and focus on the important parts of the code design in our reviews. Let's go. But what if uh, you still care about what uh, what you nitpicked before? My suggestion is to automate what you think uh, you'd otherwise nitpick. 
add lint checks and code style enforcers to your CI. Absolutely. This is like the simplest thing is just agree on a set of prettier rules. You know, you're going to have to push back on some things. You, and at the end of the day, somebody, you have to designate a time box for argument and a way to resolve all conflicts and just do it. You will argue over any rule no more than five minutes. And if there is a pure tie, you flip a coin, right? And that's just that. And you move on. And, and just who cares, right? I'm a four-space indenter. Some people are two-space indenters. I think two-space indenting is dramatically worse for a code base because it allows you to indent more without feeling the pain of indenting. I also only choose 80-line characters right here, okay? I, when I, uh, well, this is templating. Templating you have no choice on. And in HTML, you have no choice on. But in JavaScript, I enforce 80 lines. Why? Because it makes me think about refactoring much, much more. It's a personal opinion. Now, some people don't like that. Some people like tabs. I'm a, I'm a four-space indenter. That's just the way it is. Uh, it will always be that way. 40, 40 and 80. Hands down. The 480 is the best. Uh, with uh, tools, you can check problems in advance. Plus, when automation tells you you're incorrect, it's impersonal and a result of somehow less frustrating. Yeah. It's just because it is what it is. But seriously, if uh, you, you're like, let's see, if you are like how I used to be, someone who wanted every line of code to be perfect, just try letting it go a bit. Check your a low gaff before you comment. What the hell is a low gaff? It's another down. Can you just tell me what the hell it is? What the hell is a low gaff? Level of give a fuck. Ah, yes. I think everybody needs to check that level and adjust it a little bit. You know what I mean? Because here's the deal is that the only things that are going to screw you are bad logic. The only things that are going to screw you are really obnoxiously long functions that need to be refactored. That's it. And you know, and lastly, the thing that's going to screw you is uh, too much unit testing or not enough unit testing. So I built like recently, here's a good example. I recently built a bit of a Conway, a Conway game of life thing. And to make sure my Conway game of life stuff works in this little JavaScript thing I was building, I just put a simple test. I wanted to prove to me that I could do Conway correctly. And this didn't cover all the cases, uh, but it covered enough of the cases for me to be happy, right? And so for me, that's a sufficient, I, like, I don't need a ton of tests to tell me when things are wrong. I could have added one more to have the four or more population will kill out, uh, you know, a pixel. I didn't. Good enough. Don't care. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Uh, I feel like people sometimes way over test things. There's like 1,800 tests to test every possible case and every little thing. And I'm like, you know, that's not the hard part. You know, the hard part isn't there, right? You, you've done something. Or people test like the dumbest functions. Have you ever seen that where someone will test like a, like just like a literal for loop? It's like a uh, function foo. And it's just like uh, for let i equals zero, is, uh, is be less than 10. Oh, my goodness. 10 i plus plus uh, return if i, you know, uh, if i equals five uh, return true. Return false. I mean, this is terrible code, but you get the idea. Uh, it's just like, stop. Do we need a 10,000 test to run? I, I've, I don't care about code coverage. I care about code that's hard. Okay, if I can't get this right first try, I test it. Pretty much my general rule of thumb. And so, I don't know. I have a bunch of things where I think that people go off the rails in what they require, and then it just ends up being such a huge pain in the ass. At the end of the day, it's just one gigantic ass pain, and it really never made your code base better. We have, we have, we have tests at Netflix, like 10,000 of them, and 8,000 of them run every single time, and they provide nothing. They've never provided anything. They'll never provide anything. They'll just keep on being tested because that's just what it is. And I feel bad about that. I don't want that. There you go. That's that. That's my personal feeling. Get out of here. Don't nitpick so much, okay? Stop nitpicking. The name is don't nitpick my code or I'll ignore you. I'll block you on Facebook, okay?